I'm delighted to welcome our fantastic panel, Stephen Griffith, Wendy Barclay, Emma Thompson, and Gavin Yemi, who will discuss lessons learned from COVID-19 and are we ready for the next pandemic? Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to Belfast. Um, we, we didn't think that traveling to Belfast would be too problematic, but um, unfortunately, we are hit by the subject of this hot topic that we're about to discuss. Unfortunately, the Barnard Castle uh, Conference Center wasn't available for booking at this point. So um, what we're here to do today really is to talk about, you know, as, as we've mentioned, perhaps one of the most important um, microbiological events in the past century or more. And we've amassed a fantastic panel of people who are here who are true experts in the field to, to come and speak to you about that. Um, we have Gavin Yamey, um, who is joining us from Duke University. He's actually signed into a hotel so as not to disturb his family because it's 4 a.m. his time over there and we'll hear from Gavin in a moment. We also have Wendy and Emma and I'll introduce them properly in very shortly. So it really is important that we discuss this topic. It's a massively important pandemic and it would have been really remiss of us not to discuss this topic. I remember um, the last time that our virus division all met in person, it was when I'd just taken over this chair and I thought I was going to make it as the only virus division chair that wouldn't have to organize a live conference, but here we are. Thank you to the uh, current chair for that privilege. And we were discussing what to um, talk about in, in, in the sessions that we were planning for 2020. And there were lots of things on the agenda, things like African swine fever, and whatnot. And then we'd heard about this coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan. And we'd done Zika, we'd done Ebola, and we all decided as a consensus, probably my fault, that really people didn't want to hear about another virus outbreak in the sessions. But how wrong could we be? So what we're going to do today is we're going to hear some really excellent talks from our panelists. And then we're going to open the floor to questions um, to anybody that wants to ask anything, um, mainly scientifically, about the pandemic. We've always in the UK exceeded, and we're here because of our vaccines and our fantastic scientific base in the UK. Um, maybe the government hasn't always followed that science, but there's absolutely no doubt that the scientific advice has always been second to none. So first of all, let me introduce Gavin, who I hope will appear on a screen behind me. He has a pre-recorded talk, and then he'll join us for questions. And Gavin is a professor of global health at Duke University over in the States. Um, he's um, the director of their Policy Impact and Global Health Unit over there. He's a member of the Technical Advisory Group for the WHO Programme on Financing Common Goods for the Health of COVID-19 Vaccine Development Task Force, hosted by the World Bank. He's also an academic advisor of the consultation process that led to the launch of COVAX. And he's been the commissioner for three Lancet commissions on investigating health on global surgery and global TV. So hopefully all being well, our Atlantic link will, will work and I will hand over to our first speaker, Gavin. Hello, my name is Gavin Yamey. I'm a professor of global health and public policy here at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, USA. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak at the Microbiology Society annual conference. I'm sorry I cannot be with you uh, in Belfast today. I am going to speak for about 10 minutes uh, on global vaccine equity during this COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, we've seen the very best of international health collaboration during COVID-19, the fastest vaccine developed in history. But we've also seen the limits of international collective action. We know right now that about eight in 10 people in high income countries have had at least one vaccine dose. Um, that proportion is only around one in 10 in low income countries. That has been called global vaccine apartheid or global vaccine inequity, limited supply and limited brand options in low and middle income countries. And I'm afraid that there is a sense in some highly vaccinated high income countries with you know, loads of doses stockpiled that the pandemic is kind of over. And we saw that with HIV, TB, malaria, these diseases largely controlled in rich countries um, and still causing huge numbers of uh, deaths 
um, and morbidity in lower and middle income countries. And I'm worried that that's going to happen again uh, with COVID-19. So I'm going to argue in the next nine or 10 minutes that now is the time to renew and reinvigorate our push for countries uh, to scale up vaccination campaigns in a country-led equitable manner. I'm going to very briefly touch on how we got where we got to. That's been quite well described, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Then I'm going to talk about why equity matters. And lastly, I'm going to touch on some of the ways in which uh, we can ensure that nobody is left behind when it comes to fairness and equity uh, in global vaccination. We know that one huge problem has been that high income nations were able to secure uh, supply more quickly from manufacturers uh, than lower middle income countries. They bought doses from manufacturers that didn't actually run into supply problems. And manufacturing was pretty limited in lower middle income countries with some exceptions, China, uh, Cuba, India, those countries were manufacturing their own vaccines, but there hasn't been a lot in the way of capacity building for manufacturing in these settings. And it takes time to stand up that manufacturing capacity. So at the start of the pandemic, um, high income countries, upper middle income countries were able to secure doses quicker. And yes, there was a international mechanism set up to try and ensure vaccine equity called COVAX. I was part of an advisory committee, an unpaid advisory, advisory committee that helped in the design of COVAX, um, a global buyer's pool, if you like. The idea was that if you know, all of the world bought doses through COVAX, um, that would have really uh, funded research and development, it would have funded manufacturing at risk, it would have helped to drive prices down because there would have been this huge pool of buyers and it would have subsidized doses for lower middle income countries. But the reality is about three dozen nations bypassed COVAX in a sort of me only, me first vaccine grab and they just cleared the shelves of doses. And so there weren't that many doses left for COVAX to purchase doses for low-income countries and lower middle-income countries. We know that there was great price variation. In fact, in some situations, lower middle-income countries were being charged more per dose for some vaccines. And then, of course, you know, we can't ignore that, that health systems weaknesses uh, in low-income countries and lower middle-income countries have made you know, deployment more difficult. Um, weaknesses in supply chain, infrastructure in the health workforce. And yes, there have been variations within countries uh, in vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine uptake has been very high um, in many countries of the world, but there are some communities um, that have been hesitant. And that has a complicated history, um, no doubt related to a history of colonial medical and vaccine research. Um, uh, that has um, diminished trust in vaccines. There have been examples of research abuse. Um, but there's also evidence to suggest that the scarcity in supply and the unpredictability in supply also hindered building confidence in vaccines. There is as much of a case for global vaccine equity today as there has been since the start of the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and highly effective, particularly at reducing hospitalization and deaths. And it is unjust that I, uh, living here in a high income country, am as protected as could be. I've had three doses of an mRNA vaccine uh, whereas those in um, poorer nations are being left behind. One also sometimes hears a, I think, very unfortunate uh, myth, um, a very inequitable one, I would argue. I've heard people say, well, you know, there's no need for lower middle income countries 
to have vaccine doses. They really weren't affected very much by the pandemic. And that's actually not true. Um, excess deaths per capita have actually been highest in middle income countries, not in high income countries. It's also, I think, really distasteful and I would argue um, highly problematic ethically when you hear people argue that, you know, Omicron has given people enough immunity. There's no need for them to be vaccinated. That's also um, really not based on science. Um, of course, people will have some infection induced immunity if they got infected and survived, um, but it is not going to be as robust and durable as vaccine induced immunity, and nor does it provide the same protection against future variants. We could avert a huge number of deaths if we vaccinate the world. In one study, Savinka and colleagues estimated that if we were to give everybody in low income countries and lower middle income countries three doses of an mRNA vaccine, that's called being up to date on vaccination, we could avert 1.5 million deaths from COVID-19. Yes, that would cost money. They estimate it would cost around $61 billion. But to put that into perspective, the IMF estimates that the economic losses from COVID-19 are going to be around $14 trillion from 2020 to 2024. We know that uncontrolled viral transmission affects economies. Um, it's hindering economic growth in low and middle income countries, but also those economic losses are borne by high income countries as well. Uh, through disrupted supply chains um, and through reduced exports. You will probably have seen Seth Berkeley, the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, writing uh, recently in the BMJ that perhaps the most urgent need and urgent priority when it comes to global vaccine equity is around reducing the risk of future variants. The uncontrolled spread of SARS-CoV-2 in mostly unvaccinated populations, is a risk factor for new variants uh, of concern. And vaccination is going to be one of the best ways of protecting against uh, the, the risk of new variants arising. And we cannot be certain that the next variant will be less severe than Omicron. In addition to vaccinating the world, we must, of course, ensure equitable access to boosters, uh, to, to diagnosis, to, to new treatments. Um, that whole package is going to be uh, absolutely essential for bringing the pandemic to a close and turning SARS-CoV-2 into something that's akin to a, a cold. So how do we get there? Just in the last few minutes, let me just say that we really need countries to be in the driving seat. Countries should be setting their own priorities and their own targets. Some countries, for example, have said the most important thing for them is to protect high-risk people first, health workers, the um, elderly, uh, those with pre-existing medical conditions. Secondly, there's clearly a role for donations. Um, Unfortunately, rich nations have not met their donation targets and donations have often come very late. Uh, many doses have had to be thrown away because they were donated at a time when they were close to expiration. We need to make sure that doses are timed with when countries want them, need them and can use them. The timing has to be improved and COVAX said it will work on that. We need to support countries with some of the logistical hurdles, some of the operational hurdles that they are facing uh, in their national vaccine programs. Fourth, we've got to abandon this old fashioned charity model, a kind of a trickle down model where we make doses in the rich world and then just give a few away like a sort of crumbs from a rich person's table model. That is out of date, that is a colonial approach. Countries should be able to manufacture doses themselves, a bottom-up, decentralized, globalized uh, response to the pandemic where vaccines are made worldwide. Of course, 
That means intellectual property sharing. It means tech transfer. And we are seeing more promising signs of that happening, such as the WHO's uh, mRNA vaccine hub in South Africa that uh, will shortly, I hope, be providing vaccines initially for six countries in the sub-Saharan African region. Regional initiatives, number five, are going to be increasingly important. We have seen the African Union's African Vaccine Acquisition Trust procuring vaccines. We've seen a similar facility in Asia, the Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility. And finally, there is obviously great hope that we will be making variant specific vaccines, nasal vaccines that may provide sterilizing immunity. And it's absolutely crucial that we make sure that those become available fairly and equitably uh, worldwide, along with new COVID-19 treatments like Paxlovid, monoclonal antibodies, and so on. So to conclude, I, I would say that we are really at a, a pivotal moment right now we need to recommit to global uh, equity for vaccines and other COVID-19 uh, countermeasures. We can't prematurely move on from the pandemic now. That may seem uh, attractive in the short term, but it would be a moral failure from which the world will not easily recover. I want to just end by saying that the, my comments today um, uh, have come largely from a paper that uh, myself and nine colleagues around the world published recently in the BMJ, colleagues in Peru, South Africa, Bangladesh, the US um, and uh, uh, Canada. And I just want to credit them as well. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks ever so much, Gavin. I know he's listening. Um, so without further ado, because we are a, a little behind schedule, I'm going to introduce Emma Thompson, who is a clinical professor of infectious disease at the Centre for Virus Research in Glasgow. And Emma's going to talk to us about virus evolution and surveillance, which of course is absolutely critical going forwards um, if we're ever going to get through this. Okay, over to Emma. Thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation to uh, speak today in person in Belfast. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about genomic, particular genomic, but also serological surveillance um, and what it can tell us about new variants and perhaps how this might help us prepare better for the next pandemic. Um, so I think there are a number of um, lessons that we learned from the surveillance, the genomic surveillance, which happened in the UK, which uh, of course was part of the uh, COG UK consortium initially and then handed over to the public health agencies and this initiative was led um, by Sharon Peacock. So the transmission patterns I think is perhaps one of the first the first lessons that we learned um, from monitoring the genetic uh, uh, variation that we saw in SARS-CoV-2 and um, there were a couple of papers very early on showing how uh, SARS-CoV-2 was introduced to the UK at very, very high frequency in the first month. So there were over 1,000 introductions through international travel in the first month of the pandemic. And it, we really learned that more through the genomics than through the um, epi, which, um, but uh, the combination of both, of course, is, the, is, is a more powerful tool. And gradually, as the, the, it was more possible to track people um, the combination of genomics alongside uh, detailed epidemiological and clinical data has been a real strength, I think, of the response. Um, and I think I, I'd just quite like to go back and look at some of the things that we learned very early on uh, about transmission. So we, we noted firstly that there were single polymorphisms in the genome of SARS-CoV-2, which were associated with firstly um, an increase in transmission, but not actually immune escape. And, and that the first of those to be described was D614G. And then um, later we started to monitor uh, looking for immune evasion. And I think this has been something that I hope that we will con continue to do um, and has been really centrally important in the response. So, um, <clears throat> 
One of the first um, single polymorphisms that was noted to be associated with immune escape was N439K. And um, this actually arose in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, in Scotland and then disappeared uh, and then re-emerged in Central Europe and Romania and other countries. And um, it was the first sort of single polymorphism which showed us perhaps how plastic the spike protein might be. And um, of course heralded um, the advent of new variants. At the moment, um, we're at BA2, uh, but uh, there is really very little doubt that we'll see more variants uh, over time. And these uh, variants have become increasingly immune evading so when you look at the, the um, structure of spike, um, you can see the accumulation of mutations, um, the majority of which are immune evading, but actually in Omicron, um, there are parts of spike where there are mutations which are governing different uh, facets of the, the um, biological life cycle. Uh, we um, looked at neutralization recently of Omicron variants uh, and the, the variants BA1, BA2 and BA1.1 uh, in um, people who had received deployed vaccines and found, uh, as, as others have done, that um, the, there is very significant immune evasion even after three doses of vaccine um, with Omicron. Of course, we know uh, from data from UKHSA and other um, people that, uh, um, in fact, although neutralization is not perfect, uh, that the prevention of severe illness and um, death is substantially re reduced following vaccination. We also know, um, and maybe just highlight um, the first panel here, um, which shows overall with all vaccines, um, what neutralization looks like. So it's pretty good with Wuhan. Of course, all vaccines, except for uh, vaccines and trials at the moment, are all directed against Wuhan. Um, you can see that there's a substantial drop with all of these variants. But uh, with BA2, I think there may be a very slight decrease um, further than the others. And that, that uh, doesn't really come through with polyclonal sera. But when you look at um, the monoclonal antibodies that are used in treatment, you can see that there's quite a drop um, with Omicron uh, BA1 against BA2 uh, with the monoclonal antibody sotrovimab. Um, this, is, this here is, um, is um, ronoprev. Uh, you can also see when you look at the individual responses that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity between second and third dose sera. So, um, against Wuhan, there's an all, overall rise in neutralization. But um, with BA1 and BA2, um, you see this sort of heterogeneity in, in terms of um, responses after uh, dose three. T cell responses are largely unaffected. And I think uh, one of the other key lessons from, I think this is something that we've got a lot better at in the UK, is the importance of linked data sets. Um, it's all very well looking at the genome of the virus and then looking at neutralization assays and so on. But actually, we need to be able to, to look at what's happening to our patients. And um, this is some data from um, a paper that we have in press uh, showing the rollout of vaccination in NHS Greater Glasgow Clyde. This is the rollout of the different vaccines over time. And then the emergence of different variants in people who've had different doses of, of vaccine. And I, I just highlight here panel C, which shows that, um, as others have shown, that there's a very significant uh, drop in vaccine effectiveness in people who've had two doses of vaccine uh, against the Omicron uh, variant, um, any Omicron variant. Uh, but when you look at people who've had three doses, that does increase substantially. And when you look at people who've had three doses and who've had, uh, in addition, um, a, an infection with SARS-CoV-2, uh, the vaccine effectiveness is really quite high. And I think this will um, present quite a high barrier to, um, a high immune barrier for a while at least. And then the other thing that's really important in terms of linked data is uh, looking at clinical severity of disease. And so this again is um, data that we have in, 
um, preprint at the moment, um, looking at the evolution of different variants from one to the other, so B1177 to alpha, B1177 was um, originated in, in Spain. And um, you can see along the bottom here um, the different age groups. So this is um, 18 to 30 right up to over 90. And this, again, it comes from Scottish data. Um, and you can see that it, alpha was more severe than B1177 in um, just about all age groups. Similarly, um, when we looked at the transition from alpha to delta, again, the severity increased very substantially um, in delta versus alpha. We also looked at AY4.2, which looked like it was going to be dominant um, before we, we had Omicron, and um, the severity there was not significantly different. Um, and then, of course, lots of us lost sleep when we saw the structure of Omicron because there were so many uh, changes in the spike protein suggesting there was going to be very substantial immune evasion. And I guess we, we've got quite good at that kind of weather prediction in terms of looking at um, genomic data to a certain extent. And so we were quite concerned that this, would, this variant was going to be a real problem. However, we got really quite lucky because it is associated with um, much milder disease. Not that um, vulnerable people are not affected, of course, and we have a very large number of hospitalizations at the moment in the UK, but it is substantially less severe than Delta. Um, and that's, uh, that illustrates the importance of being able to link data. Then uh, I'm just going to finish now and, and hand over to Wendy Barclay, who's um, been leading the Genotype to Phenotype Consortium. But uh, um, there, is, there are messages that genomic surveillance can't give us. Um, there, there is an, a real importance for fundamental virology. Um, I would suggest that for this, um, you might look out for Joe Grove's presentation Wednesday um, about COVID-19. And this really just, this slide illustrates the switch uh, in entry process that is characterizing uh, both BA1 and BA2 Omicron, which um, uh, is, it gets into cells through endocytosis. And finally, um, what's coming next? Do we have to worry about new variants? I think um, the answer to that is undoubtedly yes. Um, there are, I think we're down to XN at the moment, and so there are many um, recombinant variants which have been described. Most of these have uh, breakpoints quite early in the, in the um, genome. And there's one which, uh, which interestingly has a delta backbone and, a, and um, an Omicron spike called XD, and um, that probably behaves fairly like Omicron, but uh, um, in terms of immunological um, sort of immune evasion. Um, but we know that, uh, that we started to learn that S2 um, defines entry, and um, Joe has done some nice um, domain swapping experiments to show that, and again, perhaps look at, out for that on Wednesday. Uh, just to say, though, that I think, although we weren't able to, to predict this change in um, virus entry from the genomic sequencing, we would now be able to use sequencing as an early warning system to look for changes in S2 and other parts of the genome to um, predict changes in clinical severity of disease, which almost certainly is associated with a switch in um, cell entry mechanism. So I'll finish there. Um, just to summarize, um, genomic sequencing has um, has real capacity to be used as an early warning system to estimate things like transmission patterns, growth rates, and also antigenic evolution. Linked data is critical and provides the opportunity to associate genomic data with outcomes, including vaccine effectiveness and clinical severity. And um, change, things like changes in cell entry of the virus are not initially predicted by genomic surveillance, um, but might now be predicted in future variants. And, uh, most of this work was funded by um, COG UK and HDR UK um, and um, yeah, involved a lot of people. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. And um, fantastic talk. And in the interest of time, I'll very quickly introduce now Professor Wendy Barclay, who's Professor of Virology at Imperial College. Uh, Wendy is very well known for her work on influenza and like many of us in 2020 pivoted onto SARS-CoV-2. 
She's a member of NerveTag, Sage, heads up half the consortia that you saw on that slide just then. And I don't think anyone uh, is unfamiliar with her work during the pandemic. So over to Wendy. Thanks very much, Steve and Emma and Gavin. Um, yeah, so it's great news. The COVID pandemic is over. Um, so the UK government have declared it over and that's wonderful. So the question is, what do we do now? Okay, so as Emma's very nicely described, what we've seen during the pandemic are these waves, successive waves of variants that have come along. And of course, we are now currently in the UK uh, experiencing BA.2, which is predominant here. And uh, the latest REACT studies in ONS surveys suggest that 6% uh, of the UK population are infected by this virus. So it doesn't feel like it's over from a virological perspective, but the great news is, of course, as Emma said, that the vaccines are largely holding up. The, the successive evolution of these variants is really driven by both trans increased transmissibility as the virus adapts to its new human host and becomes better and better at transferring through the air in airborne particles, binding to the ACE2 receptor and entering cells. And also, um, of course, as we've become progressively immune to the first wave and also vaccinated people uh, along the x-axis, you've got driving um, antigenic escape. And you can see that Omicron uh, fits the bill for both of those parameters. And for sure, there will be more. This is not surprising. I mean, whenever you get a pandemic virus that crosses from animals into humans, you expect to see over the successive waves that it will begin to adapt to the human host. I've worked on influenza for a long time, and that's exactly what you would have expected to see. I think the big question now is, uh, is it inevitable that these further adaptations are going to drive towards decreased severity because as Gavin very aptly pointed out there are many parts of the world who have not yet benefited from vaccines. Um, I'm going to go really fast here because Emma really summed this up beautifully. Uh, the bottom line is that vaccines don't really work very well against Omicron in terms of protecting against infection. So the bottom panel is UK HSA data and you can see in the grey shaded area there that about 20 to 25 weeks after a second dose, the effectiveness at blocking infection with Omicron is, is really pretty bad. You can boost it up with a third dose, but you see that even that begins to wane away by about 10 weeks. And of course, those of you who, with relatives who fit in the uh, sort of vulnerable category will know that we're now in, on a fourth booster in the UK, the spring booster. Um, Omicron is, being, uh, is, is spreading so well through households because it's highly transmissible. This is an odds ratio from a Danish household study showing that, that Omicron is more transmissible, even in households that are completely not vaccinated. But then with the added antibody pressure of vaccines, you see that sort of odds ratio increasing and increasing so that you're 3.6 times more likely to have household transmission in a fully vaccinated Omicron household than you were in a Delta household. But as Emma said, the good news is that overall, the Omicron infections are associated with milder outcomes than Delta. That doesn't mean to say that in the absence of vaccines, there's no problem. The Hong Kong outbreak about three weeks ago illustrated the devastating effect of an elderly population that have not been vaccinated, even with this Omicron virus. But on the, on the left-hand side here, you see again an odds ratio or hazard ratio, the likelihood of dying from either Omicron or Delta. So Omicron um, is much less likely, even in the elderly to, to lead to death. And then on the right hand side, the gold standard animal model now, the Syrian golden hamster, infected with equal doses of successive waves of the virus. And the two pink ones that are lying along the top there are the two Omicron variants, BA.1 and BA.2. You see that they hardly make the animals sick at all in contrast to the earlier waves. And, and as Emma said, definitely alpha and delta being more severe. So Omicron is escaping immune res response, but milder. Can we now say it's all over, everything's going to be easy from now on, it's just a common cold, or is there a potential for future recombinants or variants to evade vaccine and be more severe? And to do that, we have to understand what's going on with Omicron. And as Emma's described very nicely, we think that the spike gene is playing an important role here, and we can begin to apply now some nice virology, making recombinant viruses, as shown here, where you've got a constant backbone, if you like, of, of the virus genetics, and then switch in the different spikes with all of those variations. Uh, here we've got one with a Delta spike and one with an Omicron spike. Delta is in green throughout my talk, and Omicron is in purple. 
Now, spike, remember, is really important. It's the attachment protein that binds to the ACE2 receptor on cells. It's also the fusion machine that mediates entry either through the cell surface or through the endosome. And, of course, it's the major antigen, the component of all the vaccines we've got, the target of the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. So changes in spike are important. Here's the results from the hamster model showing that with those uh, spike switched viruses, basically the pattern maps to spike. So with a Delta virus, it, it, lose, it drives weight loss in hamsters. If you only have Delta spike, it also does that. With the Omicron virus, the hamsters don't lose weight. And with the Omicron spike, then uh, they also don't lose weight. So we're beginning to be able to pick apart, as Emma was saying, the, the, the fundamental genetic determinants of severity. You can see on this uh, picture that Omicron is incredibly good at replicating fast in nasal cells uh, from humans. You can see the two purple lines there, both the whole Omicron and then the dotted line showing the spike switch on its own. If you take cells which represent the lung cells from the lower respiratory tract, it's the other way around. Probably again explaining partly at least why Omicron is mild and Delta is more severe. And of course, Delta variant is also high, highly fusogenic. You can see on the bottom panel there, those great big syncytia being driven in infected cells by Delta, but Omicron isn't doing that. And we think that syncytia formation is partly responsible for severe disease. And as Emma's very nicely explained, we think now that we can, even within spikes, separate these phenotypes into different pieces of the genetics. So one end, the S1 end, of spike is the bit that's sticking out and visible to the immune system. It's also the part that binds ACE2 receptor, whereas the S2 end is the part that's controlling the speed of fusion, slowing the virus down and giving perhaps the, the cell a, a greater chance to respond. Now there's lots of scope for further antigenic evolution of spike. So this is a, uh, an experiment we've been doing um, called deep scanning mutagenesis. So this is not gain of function. This is expressing spike protein on its own. There's no viruses here, but then we're uh, creating libraries of spike which contain every single different amino acid at every single position. And then we're selecting those that still bind to the ACE2 receptor but evade polyclonal antibodies. And the dark and red panels there are where we get a big hit where, for example, eight out of eight people have got significant evasion if you had that mutation. So we can use this to try and forward look and say, what do we think might happen next? And how much more scope is there within Spike than we already have for antigenic escape? You can see the little purple arrows on the bottom are the mutations that Omicron threw at us that are producing antigenic escape. But you can see there are lots of other uh, black and red and yellow squares in that pattern, suggesting that there's a lot of scope. This is a very plastic protein which can um, mutate. And in fact, um, in the middle of the night, as one does, I get a, an email last night from Tom Peacock, who's a fantastic postdoc, early career researcher in my lab, uh, pointing out that there's just announced from South Africa a new Omicron variant called B.4, which has one of these mutations in it on top of the Omicron background. So it does seem that we're, we can expect what we call Omicron Plus coming now. But as well as Omicron Plus, of course, there's a lot of virus out there, a lot of scope for recombination, both between all the different Omicron variants on the right-hand side here, the different shades of purple, BA1, BA2, and now BA4. And also people are picking up Delta Omicron recombinants on the left here. And there's a particular one called XE in, XD in France, which we're a little bit concerned about. Okay, so that's where we sit with SARS-CoV-2. Lots of evolution to come. Um, the pandemic might be over, but there's going to be a lot more um, SARS-CoV-2 variants. But meanwhile, what about flu? What do those of us do now that used to work on flu? Where did flu go? Well, it went away. We all socially distanced and flu didn't, didn't survive particularly well. There was a 99% reduction in influenza cases reported since 2020. You can see here this very nice Nature Communications paper um, illustrating virus sort of sequencing and, and characterization performed by the WHO year on year. And you can see in the gray shades, there just isn't anything there. And in fact, one of the two lineages of influenza B, B. Yamagata, has gone extinct. Now that's a good thing, of course. It's always great when viruses go away from the human population. It does mean that people with those sorts of viruses in their freezer need to watch out because as time goes by and the world moves on, that virus becomes what we call a high consequence pathogen. You don't want to dig it out of your freezer and start working with it because nobody's seen it for a very long time. 
The other bad news about influenza going away is that the small boosts that we all get as a population from people getting flu every year give us a level of residual immunity, and we haven't got that at the moment. The children are unprimed, and even the adults haven't had that T-cell boosting of the, of the conserved epitopes that protects us from increased severity each, each year. What that might mean is that there's a window of opportunity for avian flu. And indeed, in the UK, in this past winter, we've had the largest ever outbreak of bird flu, highly pathogenic H5N1, widespread across the whole of Europe, carried on migratory birds, and spreading very fast through wild birds. You may have heard about the barnacle geese in Scotland. We lost 10% of, of that population. Lots of outbreaks, both in farm poultry and backyard stocks. Um, thankfully, only a single human case following very close contact with their infected ducks. But, but nonetheless, a cause for concern, at least from the animal point of view. On the other hand, there's still bird flu in China as well, but different sorts of bird flu. So, for example, H5N6, another H5 virus, but much more likely to infect people on close contact. In this year alone, 10 very severe cases of human infection. H9N2, I'll, come, I'll remind you of that in a minute, lots of cases of human H5N2, but all mild, in contrast to H5N6. We still don't really understand why some of these bird flu viruses cross into people, why some don't, why are some severe, why are some not. And talking about crossing between species, this fantastic paper from Eddie Holmes describes the virome characterization in game farmed animals in China, across the whole of China. And they find hundreds of viruses, coronaviruses, picornaviruses, anything you like, going between these animals that are, that are farmed for either medicine or meat. And 21 of those viruses have significant human pandemic potential. So there is plenty of opportunity out there for the next pandemic. It may be a coronavirus. The, the Pasteur group found, of course, highly related viruses in bats, in louse, uh, highly related to SARS-CoV-2 that bind human ACE2 receptors already just as well as the, as the current pandemic virus does. But of course there are plenty of other uh, viruses in those animals that, that Eddie and others sequenced. So just a reminder, the next pandemic, what, we, what can we expect? It will come from animals, it will look like something our immune systems haven't seen before. It will replicate well in human cells and it will transmit efficiently between people. We know that influenza viruses and coronaviruses can do this, but we're still not quite sure about other viruses, paramyxoviruses, Nipah. What should we be looking out for? I'm going to sum up or leave you with this as, as a summary of what I've told you. Um, the bottom line is that influenza viruses and coronaviruses are important. Um, although the vaccines have been absolutely fantastic in saving lives, uh, not everybody has them. And we're now at a point where there's a real debate to be had, I think, about whether or not we need to update the current vaccines we have, which are still based on the Wuhan-like sequence, which was the virus that first emerged, whereas the viruses we're trying to protect people against really look significantly different. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, we are approaching 10 o'clock, and people are welcome to go to the next sessions if they like. But if anyone has um, some questions they would like to put to our panel, we've probably got time for one or two of those. Please come to the microphone if that's the case. <laughs> 